Hello, travelers. Welcome to Reach the World STEM Week. For over 20 years, Reach the World has inspired youth to become curious, confident, and compassionate global citizens via virtual exchange. My name is Tim, and as part of Reach the World's efforts to support educators and families during the COVID-19 pandemic, we are using the power of Zoom to share free live stream events with members of our global community. You can find a complete listing of upcoming events, great at-home learning resources, and much more on our website, at home.reachtheworld.org. Today, I'm very excited to welcome Benjamin A. Gilman, International Scholarship Recipient and Reach the World All-Star Traveler, Brianna Pinto. Brianna is gonna tell us what it's like to track animals in Panama. And if you wanna learn more about Brianna and her experiences in Panama after our call, I'd encourage you to check out her Reach the World virtual exchange articles. They're amazing. And we'll add a link to that journey in our chat bar. You should definitely check it out. To all of our live stream viewers today, welcome. The YouTube chat bar is the perfect way to let us know you're here and share any questions you have for Brianna. If we do absolutely want to hear from you and we'll get to as many of your questions as possible today after Brianna's finished speaking. But without further delay, it's time to journey virtually to Panama. Welcome to Reach the World, Brianna. Hi, thank you for having me. All right, let's get started on our journey. So hi, as you heard, I'm Brianna, and I'd like to tell you all about my time that I spent tracking animals in the jungle in Panama. I spent three months on an island there and had an amazing time. So let's get started. So before I ever got to go to Panama, uh, I was just a student at the University of California, Davis. And I came to UC Davis because I've always loved animals and being outdoors. And Davis has a great wildlife biology program where I could learn all about animals and how to help them and conserve their habitats. Um, and one thing that I did when I started at Davis is I worked in the lab of a professor who studied animal behavior and animal movement. And so uh, what that meant is that you'd go into a room every week or so and spend a couple hours in front of the computer, just playing with numbers, working on data, watching videos of monkeys and um, doing a lot of stuff behind the computer. And after about six months of that, she asked if I'd like to be a field assistant at her research station in Panama. So of course I said yes. And so Panama, if you didn't know, is in Central America, which is just us above South America there. And her research station is all the way in the middle of the Panama Canal on an island called Barro, Colorado Island. And uh, Barro, Colorado Island, or BCI as we like to call it for short, wasn't always an island. Uh, when they were first making the Panama Canal back in the early 1900s, in order to collect, connect the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean, they had to flood a big section of the country in the middle. So the area you see labeled as Patoon Lake used to be a valley and BCI used to be a mountaintop. So when the island became an island, the Smithsonian went in and said, hey, we'd like to know more about how the ecosystem on this island uh, is affected by being separated from the mainland the way it is. They want to see what happened to the changes in the animals and the plants that live there. And so they established a research station that's still there today. And 104 years later, I got to go and visit DCI for myself. As you can see, it's not a whole lot of buildings. All those little red rooftops there are the only buildings really on the whole island. The rest of it's just forests and trails that scientists can explore to learn more about the tropical animals that live there. And so what was my job when I was on DCI? Well, the professor that I worked for was interested in a few different things. She wanted to study uh, frugivorous mammals or mammals that eat fruit. And so she studied kawadis and kinkajous, uh, which are both related to raccoons. Kawadis live on the ground and they're awake during the day and kinkajous live in the trees and they only come out at night, they're nocturnal. And she also wanted to know more about the habits of capuchin monkeys and spider monkeys. And we were learning about where they moved and where they lived and their activity based on technology called remote sensing technology. And that's just a fancy way of saying we were able to watch the animals and know what they're doing without actually being there to see them. How do we do that? We use a fancy thing called a GPS collar. And this is one, it's kind of big. It's one we would put on kawadis, but we have smaller ones for monkeys and kinkajous. And a GPS collar is a really amazing tool for learning about how animals behave when we're not around. It's got two parts to it. On the left, you see that little black nubbin, that's a radio transmitter. And that's how we can hear where the animal is to find it. 
I'll tell you more about that in a second. And then on the right, you can see that big black thing. That's a battery and there's a memory card too to log data. And um, we can get data about the animal's location, like where it would be on a map using GPS like you have on your phone. And we could also learn about its activity levels. So how much it's moving around, you know, what its body position is. And that gives us an idea of when it's most active during the day, when it's up to the most stuff. And we can know so what it's doing, where it's going, all without being there to see it. And that gives us a lot of information for the whole day because we can watch like 20 animals at once, this method. And so here's what the location data would look like. Um, you see up on the top right in that light lavender there, that's one of the kinkajous we have named Molly. We like to give them names so that we can remember who's who instead of ID numbers, because those are kind of long. Um, and you can see the kinkajous, Molly and Jeff, don't really like to hang out together all that much. So we call those different areas territories. They've got their own separate territories. Meanwhile, the capuchin monkeys, you know, they have less rigid paths. You can see they kind of just wander all over the island, doing their thing and hanging out together. And so to collect this information, right, we'd either have to get the collar back or we can use a special thing called a download. So there's a couple steps to getting the data off of those collars because those little memory cards inside are just like on your phone. They fill up after a bunch of, after time. So we need to go out about every week to get the information off of the collars so that they can keep collecting more. So first we listen for the animal using that little radio transmitter I mentioned. So you can see my field partner Alexis here has a radio up to his ear with an antenna and he's listening for the little pings of the animal's collar. And then once we've found the animal based on listening, it's kind of like a hot and cold signal. Then we can get close enough for the information to wirelessly download using that antenna that I'm holding and it'll go onto the base station that's around my hip. So here's a closer look at some of that gear. Here's the antenna, those little branches on it help focus the signal in so it's more precise. We can tell where the animal is better. And we also use the base station and the radio receiver. And so this kinkajou here is one that we call her named Mario. And he's just up in this balsa tree snacking on some flowers. And his collar, every second or so, is pinging out and sending out a little beep. I mean, I am listening on my radio when I hear that. Um, and so then when I get close enough, the data from his collar starts to go to my antenna where it travels into the base station and gets recorded. And then everything on his collar is white so we can start recording new information for the next week. And so we had about 20 different animals we were following. And like I said, remembering numbers for all of them would be difficult. So we gave them little nicknames instead. And then each collar they had it had its own unique radio frequency, kind of like a radio station that we would tune into. So we'd say, okay, it's been a while since we caught Tony Stark and got information from him. We know where he hangs out because we have past location logs on him. Let's tune into his radio station and find out where he is today. And we'd walk around, listen for those pings until they got loud enough that we knew he were close by. <laughs> and one thing about BCI being a mountain formerly is that the middle of the island is way higher than the rest of it. And so to get from one side of the island to the other to find some of the animals, it was oftentimes easiest to just boat around instead of hiking all the way up and all the way down and then all the way back up to get back to the lab again. And so I thought that boating around was one of the most fun parts of my job because sometimes you just wake up in the morning and hop on a boat and get taken all the way around to the other side of the island. And it was just fantastic. Um, and we could also use boating sometimes if an animal knew that we knew um, hung out close to the shore. And so imagine off in the trees there is one of our spider monkey friends and his collar is pinging. The water or the signal can bounce off of the water into my antenna so I can download his data. One time when we were doing this though, things didn't go, quite go to plan. <laughs> and um, sometimes your boat doesn't work anymore and you have to radio in to the forest guards and have them come tow you back in, as you can see in this picture on the left um, with my friend in the field, Lucia. <laughs> we went out to do something just like that, get a spider monkey, and luckily we were, uh, BCI has the resources to have people um, that are keeping us safe that we can radio into and ask for help. And not every field station has that. So that was <laughs> a very adventurous day. Uh, but in addition to going and tracking all the animals, we do have to get the collars off eventually because that battery that I mentioned, it runs out. And so once the battery dies, you know, we're out listening for the animal, we realize like, okay, we're not really getting any downloads anymore. I guess this is probably the end. We should get ready to take their collar off. 
And so we do that by trapping the animals in what we call tomahawk live traps. Um, it's just basically a big box with a door that hinges open. We can set it. And then when the animal walks inside, they step on a little paddle that triggers the door shut. And so then they're just in a little box. It doesn't hurt them or anything. And they spend the night there until we can come pick them up in the morning. And so on the left, you can see Alexis is setting up what we call a freighter pack so that we can carry out um, traps like I have on the right to the different spots where we know that our animals hang out. And so the best way to get animals to visit the trap is to bait them. And we would usually use bananas because they're really smelly and smelly and tasty smelling when they get old. And the Kawadis are pretty smart and they could figure out when we were setting the traps and they would usually come and try and steal the banana out before a kinkajou could come by and get it. <laughs> and I got to do some other fun activities as well as part of my daily tasks. Um, one of the jobs that I had was testing out a new type of collar that was gonna test and measure for elevation or altitude. And so to do that, I had to climb this big tall tower and get to the top and make sure that the collar was actually recording how high I got up. So that was a fun part of the job. And we also used some different trapping methods than just real live trapping, but camera trapping. So camera trapping is really neat because we can't collar every single animal in the forest. That would take forever and that would be a whole lot of effort. But to know what kind of animals are hanging around maybe by the places where our collared animals like to hang out, we can set out a camera trap. And every time an animal walks by, it'll trigger the camera with a motion sensor, right? And we can get an idea of who's hanging around. Like this tamandua here is a type of anteater that I only saw like twice when I was there. But this camera trap can pick up a lot of elusive animals that wouldn't necessarily want to hang around when there's you know, humans out stomping around super loud. So that's a lot of work and it was very fun work but also very tiring so what can we do to kind of blow off some steam and have a good time about every week or so every other week we've got to panama city and that's a 45 minute boat ride and then another hour into the driving into the city um, but usually we would go to listen to other scientists talk about their research we even presented our own and then once we were done listening to the scientists we'd usually go to the mall have some lunch uh, there's lots of familiar spots like McDonald's, KFC, uh, some less familiar spots, a little bit of everything though. It's also a good time to stock up on groceries because on the island, they don't stock snacks like Pop-Tarts in the kitchen. You have to bring those on your own. There's also a cool neighborhood called Casco Viejo that has lots of restaurants and cool places to hang out. And that's like the historic quarter, the old square of Panama City. So really beautiful. And then, after our day in the city is done, we've had our dinner and we've gotten back on the boat. On BCI, there's still lots of fun stuff to do. So after a long day of research, nothing beats getting a nice big dinner. All the scientists would eat dinner together and lunch and most every meal together. And we sit at a big long table and talk about our days, what we've seen out in the field, how our projects are going, what we plan to do next, what we watched on Netflix last night. Uh, there's only about 20 scientists that live on the island. They come from all over the world. So we become good friends pretty quickly. Also, work is hard. So I would spend a lot of my free time just taking naps either on my bed or on my little balcony. I hung up a hammock and I'd watch the capuchin monkeys go by on their way to eat some food in the trees. But also when night comes, we like to have fun. We have ping pong tournaments. People play live music out on the deck. We bake bread together and make snacks. and have a whole lot of fun. Dancing was a really popular activity too. People like to dance a lot in Panama. And I celebrated my 20th birthday on the island. We had a little party and that was really special for me because everyone signed a card and we made cake and it was very memorable to have a whole party with my scientist friends. And I took a couple lessons away from my time on Borough, Colorado that whether or not you're gonna be researching in the rainforest, I think you might wanna know. So I think the most important lesson of this whole journey is that monkeys will throw fruit at you if given the chance, if not branches or worse. So when you're going to track monkeys out in the field, you always want to carry an umbrella so that they can't get you with anything. I also was not a big fan of bugs before going to BCI, like at all. And 
in the tropics, bugs get pretty big and there's a lot of them. And so I had to deal with that pretty quickly. Uh, there's mosquitoes, there'd be cockroaches in my room at night sometimes, you know, big ones on the wall. If you go out at night and you wear a headlamp, all the moths fly into it. I swallow flies sometimes, but the spiders, the ones who I thought I'd be afraid of the most were actually the most respectful bugs that I encountered. They had the good sense to get out of my way if I was coming into theirs. So like little tarantulas, like you might see on the left there. Uh, there's like cinder block blocks that make up the steps of a lot of the paths and they would make little condos inside the hole inside those cinder blocks. And so they might be out cruising around looking for dinner at night and you come walking by on the steps and they'll start back into that hole and hide from you. Um, the spider on the very far right, that's called a golden orb weaver, and they are big and they are everywhere. So when I was walking through the paths, they would like to make their webs across the big paths. There's a nice big, big open space that a bug might fly through that they could eat. And so in order to keep me from getting spider web in my face, every time I walked through those paths, I would hold my antenna out in front of my face just to catch anything. And if they saw me coming, they'd run to the edge of their little spider web and try and get away. <laughs> And some spiders are just happy to see it, like the guy in the middle. A big lesson that's important for anyone anywhere in tick country is to wear long pants and socks when you know that they're gonna be around. If you're out playing in tall grass, you're gonna wanna make sure you're protected because ticks are not cool, they can make you sick. And so even though it was super hot and humid every day I was out there and I'd be hiking and getting sweaty, I'd still always wear a full protective outfit to keep myself protected from biting bugs like ticks. So you can see I've got big rain boots on to keep me um, dry when I'm slogging through the mud. But then under those boots, I'm wearing not one, but two pairs of socks. I wear a pair of socks and then I tuck my pants over this one pair and then wear another pair over them. And I got a long sleeve shirt too so that my arms don't get anything biting them or there's a lot of irritating plants that I could have you know, brushed up against that would give me a rash or something. So. Lots of fun stuff to encounter in the jungle. <laughs> really though, the most important lesson that I learned was about teamwork and just having a good supportive team behind you helps you be able to get anything done. I had a great time working with everyone that I was with in the field. And I really am so glad that they were patient with me as I learned how to be a field biologist. And I think we had a really great time together. Alexis was a great field partner. We would try and speak Spanish and English back to each other when we were walking around because we were both kind of learning each other's languages. And I really couldn't have done everything I did out there without them, that's for sure. So enough about me. I'm sure you want to hear more about some of the animals that I saw. And while I was studying mammals, I actually saw a lot more of other types of animals than mammals. Um, usually we were downloading at, uh, downloading data from our animals, we wouldn't get that close to them and usually wouldn't see them either. Sometimes we could hear them, but we're usually about a football field away so that we don't scare them. So this is a little idea of what I might see every day I was going out on my hikes. So there's lots of birds on the island. You hear them singing everywhere. There's lots of colorful ones like the trogon on the left or on the right, there's some more reclusive, really well camouflaged ones like this tinamou. They're kind of like chickens. They could fly a little bit, but not much. So if you heard something rustling in the bushes, it was probably one of these guys. There's also birds of prey, like the caracara -cara getting chased away by this mockingbird. And I thought they were always really cool to see. I'd like to identify them when I saw them up in the sky. The beauties were one mammal that we saw a lot. They're kind of like bunny rabbits in that you'd hear them munching on food and they were just kind of everywhere. And see a whole lot of squirrels or bunny rabbits, but I saw a lot of agouti. <laughs> Can you see the bug in this one? There's a Katie did in the middle. I think that these guys are super neat. There was lots of bugs that showed great camouflage. So this Katie bit is trying to blend in with these leaves by looking like a leaf himself, and that's camouflage. I think that they do a great job trying to avoid anything that might think they're a tasty bug by just saying, no, I'm a dead leaf. And even the way that they would walk sometimes made them look like they were just a leaf rustling in the wind. Super neat. The bugs that you saw by night though were a whole different story. There were scorpions and moths and lots of butterflies too that also tried to look like leaves. And then on the far right, you see that guy doesn't blend in so well, but we think that's because he just shed an exoskeleton and now is trying to harden up again. So he was probably a little disturbed that we walked in on him in that moment. 
and there were bugs of all sizes. Like I said, lots of bugs. <laughs> There's little small guys like the dung beetle on the left up to big grasshoppers that I thought were birds when I first saw them flying by. Um, on the right, you can see he's about as big as my pen. And that would have really bothered me when I first got to the island. But with time and having enough bugs hit my face and nothing happened, I started to get used to it. You can see, yeah, I even started to like them a little bit by the end. And for everyone that's a fan of reptiles, there are plenty of those too. The top two photos on the left there are geckos, and they would get into every wall possible. You try to take a shower, there's one in the bathroom wall. You go back to your office, there's one in the window glass. Uh, on the bottom, the iguanas also like to try to get inside, but they're a little bigger, so it's kind of difficult for them. And every once in a while, I would see a snake. I almost stepped on one once, and that was scary, but luckily, there's not a whole lot of venomous ones. I think there's only one venomous species on the island. Most of them are just constrictors or ones that like to squeeze their prey. They don't really bite them with any poison or anything, uh, like that guy up in the top right. And amphibians, too, are everywhere. Like I said, it's really moist and humid in the tropics, so that things that have uh, that need to have really humid air to breathe through their skin, like a toad or a frog, like you'd see on the left, those guys can live there and they're everywhere. A lot of the times you think you're hearing crickets or cicadas or something, you were actually hearing frogs singing. And on the right, I know that looks like a worm, but it's actually an amphibian too. They're one of my favorite types of animal. They're called Sicilians and they're amphibians that have lost their legs, kind of like snakes. And they're really rare to see because they live almost their whole lives underground or at least under the leaves. And so I was really excited to get to see this one. And of course, there were monkeys. These are the howler monkeys that would wake me up every morning uh, by yelling and proclaiming the island as their own, <laughs> as they do. And they were everywhere and so were their babies. And it was very exciting to see them all the time, despite them being a very common sight. And that is all I have for you today. I'd like to thank you for joining me on my journey and I welcome any questions that you have. Thank you. That is awesome, Brianna. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you. Wow, what, what an adventure you have. I can just really tell that you love animals and that you're in animal paradise in Panama. Definitely. Um, Madison in the chat wants to know why you love animals so much. Where did your, your love of animals begin? Now, listen, that is a great question. I was really lucky to grow up by the San Diego Zoo, so I got to go there all the time as a kid, and I think getting to see the animals up close and learn more about how they're so specialized to live the way that they do, like birds have hollow bones so they can fly. What? The animals are just so amazing, and I think just getting to have those opportunities again and again growing up really inspired my love for them. Great question. Um, Kevin would like to know, what is the smartest animal that you've done research on? Oh man, that's a really good question. I think the monkeys would definitely be up there. Uh, <laughs> like I said, those capuchin monkeys will throw fruit at you if you get too close. That's a pretty, pretty savvy animal, I would say. They have a really good capacity for learning and they're really social too, so they'll hang out with each other a lot. But like I said, those kawaii's and kinkajus, they're pretty smart too. Very cool. Yeah, there's a, a lot of students in the chat who have read your articles as part of your virtual exchange. And awesome. my, my colleague Mara just posted the link to that exchange again for anyone else who, who wants to read more about Brianna's time in Panama. It's a great place to begin. Um, and if you, we have a great audience online for the live stream. If you have other questions for Brianna, please put them in the chat. Uh, I want to take a, a moment to ask one of my own questions. I think yeah. it's so cool that scientists from around the world come to this island to conduct research in such a unique uh, ecosystem. Um, what is it like to work with people who are presumably doing different sorts of experiments and speaking different languages? How, do, how does it all work? It definitely keeps it interesting. Uh, BCI is always a rotating cast of people. You know, someone's there for a two week season, someone's there for a six month season. So there's always new people coming in and they're coming in from all over the world. So. Most of the time we either be speaking English or Spanish so we could kind of all communicate with each other, but it was amazing the different cultures everyone came from. That birthday card that I showed, that had like five different languages and signatures inside and different messages. It was really neat. And I think different scientists being around too, studying different things made it very interesting as well because um, you notice I talk a lot about bugs. One reason is because the entomologists on the island or the bug scientists were so into what they did and so enthusiastic that they kind of got me hooked too. And that, you know, having their enthusiasm rub off, it makes every journey back into the forest so much more exciting. 
because you've learned something about what they're studying and you get excited to see that too. That sounds like a great experience. I there, There's a whole like travel aspect of this adventure too. And I'm, I'm wondering what got you interested or, or when you first started sort of thinking about going to another country to conduct research. It's, it's a big leap. I mean, I know you're from California. Um, going someplace tropical like Panama is, is a big adventure in and of itself. Yeah, yeah. I, I was very scared, actually. And I really should have said that. I was very nervous to leave. I wanted to do it. I was excited. But the thought of being there all alone in a country I didn't know the language that well. You know, I took in Spanish in high school, but I couldn't really hold much of a conversation. So knowing that I have to do all the travel on my own um, to take, you know, this eight hour plane ride to get on an hour taxi to get on the 45 minute boat all by myself. It was really intimidating. And then, yeah, the country itself being so tropical, it means that there's a lot of life out there, including, you know, poisonous bugs and snakes and things that I would never encounter here in California. So it was a big opportunity to grow personally. And I am just so glad that I went because good things come out of taking leaps like that and changing your experience and doing new things. So if you're a little bit scared about something, think about why. And usually it just means that it's something to be aware of, but you should still go for it. Fantastic, yeah. Um, Bob online wants to know what you ate in the jungle. If there was any sort of aspect of, of uh, general cultural cuisine in Panama that you had on a routine basis, or even if maybe you, were you able to harvest some of the things that grew on the island? I didn't eat a whole bunch of what I found out in the forest, but that is a great question. Um, we got, we were really lucky. We had a whole kitchen that would service meals three times a day. And most of what they cooked is like what they could keep around in the kitchen for a week until the new shit and this stuff came in. So it was a little repetitive, but it was a lot of things that were popular in Panamanian cuisine. So we had a lot of, um, things cooked with plantains, fried plantains, plantanitos, like all sorts of, you know, banana-like things. A lot of stuff with corn. Uh, they had made these like hockey puck tortillas. They called them tortillas, but they were thick, not like a Mexican tortilla. <laughs> um, and those were popular with breakfast. They were fried, they were at dinner. Lots of meat with our meals and beans and rice. Um, and then, yeah, same thing over and over a lot of the time. <laughs> Awesome. I We have just a couple more minutes left, and I want to make sure we have a great audience of students on this call, and I know a lot of students are going to see the recording of this call as well. If somebody who's listening loves animals like you do or feels the same way about animals, what advice would you give to them for, you know, making this a part of their career and making you know, an opportunity like this possible for them? Yeah, so the biggest thing that helped me was volunteering. All when I was growing up, wherever I could, I volunteered with animals. So like I mentioned, the San Diego Zoo was my favorite place to go. A lot of the reason too that I love animals so much is I started working as an educator there in their zoo corps program for teens when I was 13 years old. Um, and so maybe your local zoo or humane society has a program like that where you can help out either with the animals or helping people learn about the animals and just being in that environment and showing your dedication that'll really help you moving forward when you start applying for jobs in those fields. Because a lot of people do want jobs working with animals. It's really fun, it's really cool. But showing that you have the experience, even if you didn't get paid for it, shows that you're dedicated and you know how hard it can be and you're willing to put up with that and be a really good worker. All right, that's great, great advice. Um, as sort of a final question before we sign off today, I wanna ask you what we ask all of our live stream participants when COVID-19 is, in the past and we are free to move about the world again, what will be your next adventure? Oh man, there's lots of places I could go, but I think one place that really interested me after being in the tropical rainforest was our own rainforest, or not rainforest, but just forests of America in general. We do have some rainforests up in the Pacific Northwest um, that I think would be really cool to visit. Um, but just, yeah, the great ecosystems we have right here at home. You don't have to travel as far as I did to see amazing nature and amazing animals that live there. All right. Fantastic, Brianna. It was so much fun talking to you today and hearing about your time in Panama. Uh, that's all the time we have. 30 minutes go so fast <laughs> when you're talking about such an interesting topic. 
Um, I really, really want to thank you for joining us. I want to thank our entire YouTube live stream audience for joining us today. Yes, thank you. Today, just so everybody knows, today's our final day of STEM focused live stream events. And we have one more event to go today. So if you want to see what it's like to simulate a journey to Mars, I hope you'll join us later this afternoon. You can invite your friends, check out the whole calendar of events at athome.reachtheworld.org. Uh, thanks again for joining us and take care, Brianna. Thank you.